John Lee made the point many times that when you're focused on the breath, you don't have just the first frame of reference or the first foundation of mindfulness. All four are right there. Breath is the body. The feelings of pleasure or pain that you've, you're encountering as you deal with the breath, those are feelings in and of themselves. And the mind state that you're trying to develop, you find that you're either hampered by defilements or the defilements are gone. Or as you get further into that third foundation, that third frame of reference, you start noticing when the mind is concentrated, when it's not, when it's expanded or enlarged, or when it's not. Whether it's a level where it's been unexcelled, or whether it's one that you've had a, something that's excelled it in the past. And then there's a fourth, the Dhammas. And often we don't have a real handle in that fourth foundation to see how useful it is. This is not just a list of all the Dharma teachings. Basically, it's a list of ways you can look at problems that come up in the course of your practice. You've got the five hindrances, you've got the five aggregates, the six sense media, seven factors of awakening, and the Four Noble Truths. And they're useful frameworks for looking at what's actually going on. And it's not an exercise in bare awareness, because in each case there's a duty. Once you've figured out what's happening, given that particular framework, you know what to do in response. For instance, as we're going around through daily life, one of the main issues in our practice is restraint of the senses. As the Buddha said, when you are looking, try to notice where is the fetter in the looking. If you're listening, where is the fetter in the listening? And the fetter here is defined as the sense of delight, the sense of passion you may have for what you're looking at or why you're looking. Because it's not always the case that a sense of delight comes up after you've noticed something. Sometimes you have a very clear idea of what you want to look for. You want to get riled up about something. You want to get attracted by something. And so you look for it, and particularly with the mind. Notice when a thought comes up, okay, what's the appeal of this thought? Why do I go for this particular kind of thinking? Once you've looked at the appeal, then look at the drawbacks. What are the drawbacks of going with that kind of thinking? If you gave that particular kind of thinking free reign in your mind, where would it lead you? If you notice there's a fetter, in other words, you're really delighting in something until it pulls you away from your center. Okay, you don't just sit there and say, oh, I'm fettered, and that's it. You've got to do something to cut the fetter, because those fetters are the cause of suffering. So the duty there is to abandon it when you notice it. Of course, the big problem here is many times we enjoy our fetters. That's what it's all about. So we have to do something we usually don't, usually don't like to do, is look at our enjoyment and see where it's causing problems. It may be nice right now, but where is it going to take you down the line? So that's a framework you can use as you go through the day. And you can use it with your meditation as well. You're sitting here focusing on the breath, and all of a sudden your mind is off on something you saw last week, or something you read yesterday. or something you're anticipating tomorrow. Look for the fetter. Where is the sense of passion? Where is the sense of delight in that particular thinking? And what can you do to see through it so that you can pry yourself away from that enjoyment? And as the Buddha noted, the best thing is to, one, pull yourself away into 
harmless thinking, thinking that's actually skillful, and then from skillful thinking on into meditation, developing concentration. This is where the two frameworks of the, the hindrances and the factors for awakening become useful. When you're trying to sit down and get the mind concentrated, it's useful to figure out exactly what's going on here, which hindrance is bedeviling me right now. Because once you're able to classify, you say, oh, this is sensual desire, and that's ill will, and this is torpor and lethargy, and that's restlessness and anxiety, or that's uncertainty, then you know what to do with it. And sometimes just recognizing it as the problem gets you over the hump. Because one of the characteristics of the hindrances is that they deceive you. When you find yourself desiring something, your mind is on the side of the desire. You don't see it as a problem. This really is something desirable. When you have ill will for somebody, that person really is awful. When the mind is torpid, well, it's time to get some rest. It's time to sleep. The mind is getting too tired, and so on down the line. You have to learn to see these things as hindrances. You have to ask yourself, what is this hindering me from? What's hindering you? from learning about what the potentials of concentration are. You sit there thinking your old thoughts and you never get any out of your old ruts. We read about the Ajans, we read about the people in the canon who've gained strong states of concentration. We read about the descriptions of concentration. What's the reality? Exactly what do those words correspond to? If you spend all your time playing around in the hindrances, you never get to know. See, we're kind of trying to bring some what they call appropriate attention to the hindrance, seeing that it is a cause of suffering, I'm trying to look for where the stress is, look where the limitation is, see how that hindrance is squandering your energy. and then look for ways to abandon it. And this is where you try to bring in the, f the factors for awakening. Mindfulness is the beginning. And once there's mindfulness, you've got to figure out what's skillful, what's not skillful here. That's analysis of qualities. And it helps you in two ways. One, it helps you figure out what you can do about a particularly unskillful state of mind, like a hindrance, and then how you can develop the rest of the factors for awakening. And as a set, this seven factors of awakening are a good framework for looking at as you're getting the mind to settle down. If it's not quite balanced, how do you bring it into balance? There's that sutta that talks about the fire. You're trying to develop the fire of concentration here. Remember that fire is the fire of jhana, that steady flame that we're trying to keep going. And sometimes it looks like it's going to get put out. because you're feeling too low a level of energy. In cases like that, you don't want to emphasize things like serenity or concentration or equanimity. You want to analyze things, get the mind moving again, analyze things as to what's skillful and unskillful, and then put in the, the effort that's needed to get rid of the unskillful qualities and develop the skillful ones. In other words, the mind takes a more active role, and in taking that active role, you can develop a strong sense of rapture, refreshment as the skillful qualities get developed. If, on the other hand, your mind is too active, that's when you try to calm it down, serenity, get the mind to focus on easing the breath, calming the breath down, working through tension in the body. So the mind gets more solid and can come to a state of equanimity where it's at equipoise. So again, these frameworks of the five hindrances and the seven factors of awakening, they're not just guidelines for bare awareness. They're a framework that tells you, okay, if you find yourself in this particular category, this is what you've got to do. They help you get a sense of what your duty is. 
where the path lies out of that particular unbalanced state, out of that particular unskillful state. Or if you find that you're balanced and the mind is doing fine, then, then your duty is to maintain it. You don't just say, oh, that's what concentration is like, and just let it pass or let it go. You try to keep it going. You try to understand what causes it. This is where you try to bring in the element of willpower. A couple years back I was talking to a group of teachers in training, Vipassana teachers, and I was mentioning just this element of trying to keep the mind steady. And one of them said, well, it sounds like you're talking about using willpower, but I know you can't mean that. And I said, it's precisely what I mean. The element of intention is willpower, but you can't just use strength of will to get things done. You have to use your understanding of cause and effect. But it's still a skillful use of your will. So these categories in the, the fourth frame of reference are there to help you know, okay, once this particular state comes up in the mind, this is what you've got to do if you really want to find true happiness. This is even clearer in the categories of the Four Noble Truths. If you analyze for things first in terms of the five aggregates, that's to understand where is the stress, where is the suffering here, where are you holding on to these things, where are you clinging to these things. And then you take your clinging apart. If it's something that's disturbing your concentration, we'll take that apart in terms of the five aggregates. Because they come under the, the category of the First Noble Truth, if they're clinging aggregates. Where is the clinging? What kind of clinging is it? Is it sens sensual clinging? Is it clinging in terms of habits and practices, views, ideas of what you are or what belongs to you? Try to comprehend it. That's the duty with regard to these things. Once you've comprehended the suffering, you should be able to see where is the cause, what's causing you to cling, where is the craving. Okay, the duty there is to abandon it. And then whatever aspects of the path are there, you develop them. All the eight factors of the path, and particularly right concentration. And this is where the five aggregates come in again. Once the mind has really settled down and you've developed the concentration, together with all the other factors, so it comes into a good state of balance. Then you start analyzing the concentration in terms of the five aggregates to see where that too is suffering, even the equanimity of the fourth jhana. has its element of suffering. So you've got to look for that. This is why it's useful to take these things apart in these ways. Okay, where is the feeling there? Where is the perception? Where is the thought fabrication? Where is the consciousness of this? Which aspect are you clinging to? Can you see the drawbacks of that clinging? This is where the Buddha has you look in terms of the three perceptions. You look for the inconstancy. Once you perceive the inconstancy, you look to see that that's stressful, then it can't possibly be the happiness that you'd like to claim as your own. There must be something better. And it's this line of thinking, this approach that finally gets you past all your attachments to something that's really solid, that's not fabricated. That doesn't carry a duty. As so John Munn once said, it's this a point where there's no duty for the mind at all. Each of the Four Noble Truths entails a duty, but this is something beyond the Four Noble Truths. It lies outside of the framework of those four frames of reference. So it's helpful to look at this fourth frame of reference as a guideline. When a problem comes up, figure out which framework is useful for analyzing where you are in the practice, 
learn to see what's going on in your mind in terms of these frameworks so you can figure out what to do. What's the duty here? It helps you to step back from just sort of being in your mind and being in your thought worlds. It helps you take them apart in terms of their elements, the things that put them together. And gives you a much much better idea of what to do with them instead of clinging to them and then suffering. This is how you take them apart. This big mass of suffering in the mind. If you learn how to take it apart, you really see it's just a pile of gravel. And each little piece of gravel is not that heavy. And you can deal with it much more easily as a piece of gravel than as part of some solid mass of rock. So try to familiarize yourself with these different frameworks, and you'll get a much better handle on how to deal with the problems in the mind.